Welcome to another edition of the Invisible Wheelchair Podcast. I'm Donald Grodoff, family coach with FamilyOCD.com and FocusedHealthyFamily.com. In the Invisible Wheelchair Podcast series, I delve into the hidden characteristics of OCD, anxiety, and anxiety disorders. The things that most people don't see, that are behind closed doors, and shut within the mind about anxiety. My goal with this, these podcasts is to bring about awareness of obsessive compulsive disorder, or OCD. Understand that I am not a doctor, therapist, or counselor, and the content, information, resources, and ideas that are talked about and brought up here in these podcasts are things that I have used, discovered, or have been recommended to me, and I always recommend to seek additional professional help in finding solutions for yourself. Thank you for listening and enjoy the podcast. This podcast was recorded August 3rd, 2018. This is podcast number 22, Not Too Left, Not Too Right, Just Right OCD. Today we want to talk about this style of uh, OCD called Just Right OCD. And let me uh, read the definition from the IOCDF uh, website, the International OCD Foundation's website. Now, a lot of this uh, you can find up there. What I'm going to do is go through what they talk about, add to it with some thoughts and some possible examples. But let me read their their kind of definition of it. Just right obsessions are thoughts and or feelings that something is not quite right or that something is incomplete. For example, a just right obsession would be a person feeling that their hands are not quite clean when washing them. An example of just right compulsions is a person washing their hands until the sense of incompleteness goes away. So that's their definition of it. And they they separate out this as a type of OCD. And, and I agree with them. I think there is that that factor that it is a a type of OCD, but I I also believe as I as I go th- as I've gone through this and studied this and looked at my own daughter's example and some of the other examples that I've run into with clients and such, I feel like just right is really a subset of most of the other styles though also because it is about getting something right and getting something. Uh, that they feel is wrong changed and their behaviors and compulsions are those things that help them, you know, change it and make it right. Um, so I, I agree that it can be considered, uh, you know, a type of it because there's probably somebody that it, it's all about that. You know, it's not like they say, it's not about somebody that thinks about harm to someone else. Um, and so it, it can be put as his own category, but I really feel like, especially as I've done more kind of research on it, that it is a subset of most of the other styles of, of, of OCD. I know in my own daughter's situation, you know, she had to, uh, get her hands the right way, the right clean in order to make sure nobody got harmed. And hers did have that harm factor to it. Something was going to happen to somebody if she didn't do things just right. And so, like I said, I feel like it's a part of, you know, all OCD. But um, and what they uh, what they talk about is as far as the difference between just right OCD and other types of OCD, uh, the way they explain it, and I'll read it right from theirs, just right symptoms are more likely to be experienced as discomfort or tension rather than anxiety. And to be honest with you, I think, you know, when you're talking about discomfort and, and tension, 
I think that is still anxiety. It's just a different level of anxiety, a different end of the spectrum of anxiety. Because when we get into, it's really about fight or flight. And fight or flight can be kicked up uh, for the for the smallest thing. And so I don't want to say the, that it, that I, it's not that they're wrong, but I believe that, you know, really tension is a type of anxiety. It's, I think what would, to me would define it better is that they're on a, a lower level of the anxiety, but at the same sense, I've seen myself that it, with anxiety disorders alone, not just OCD, but other anxiety disorders, that anxiety left alone, anxiety not treated festers and grows and becomes more intense and more uh, higher uh, volume, I guess you'd say, than if it's treated. And, you know, treatments we've already know in my past talks, I think just this, not too long ago, we talked about ERP therapy, which to me is one of the best treatments for OCD. So it Anxiety itself needs to be treated. Um, if, if, let me put that in a different way, uh, uh, clarify that. Because as I, I talk about, I think from the beginning, is anxiety is a natural process of the body. So it is part of what we are. We're not going to get rid of it. It's when it gets out of hand and when it gets overzealous, let's say, is when it becomes a problem. And so it it needs to be addressed for that, and so I I agree that it it may be showing up in just right as tension or on the lower end of the spectrum of anxiety, but I also know that that will change over time if not handled and not treated. So they talk about how it's similar to other kinds of OCD in the fact of it's all, it's about doubt that leads to the compulsions. Am I doing this right? Uh, am, am I going to do this and end, end the thoughts, end the um, obsessions? Uh, so there's doubt in the mind that leads them to continue the, the, uh, the compulsions. Uh, they also talk about that a person with OCD, and I, I've seen this too, know, they, they have a sense about this, the things they do that are unwarranted or, or not necessary or not right, but they just can't help. It, the, 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 the thoughts are too empowering and too strong that they can't stop them. And so that's why, again, treatment and methodically working on it with the ERP can help that. But so they, because I knew even like with my daughter, and I've seen it in others, that they know that the things they're doing just don't, aren't correct, aren't the right things to be doing. But the thoughts are so overwhelming that it can't be helped. Um, and of course, another, you know, thing that, that, is common with other, all types of OCD is that they believe in their mind that by doing these habits, these compulsions, they're going to stop the thoughts. They're going to bring down the anxiety. And again, initially that is that is true. They'll do it and it'll make them feel better, but that gets worse and worse. That builds so that they have to do more to get that comforting feeling to it. Um, so they they talk about the different things that can trigger. Oh, well, they, they also mention in here about the idea of ticks, uh, because ticks are part of the OCD world. Uh, it, it can be separate of, its, uh, of itself, but it also can be a very big part of, and ticks are involuntary actions of, uh, you know, yelling, uh, noises out of the mouth, they can be uh, twitches of the body, things like that. Uh, and they can also be kind of habitual things, you know, uh, clicking something, moving something, uh, sometimes in a rapid pace. Um, and so what they talk about, the difference in a, like a just right, or and I think even in just an OCD itself, the difference uh, between the uh, OCD and the tics is that 
many times the it, because it's uh, with OCD it's very very much a thought and what the compulsions can be very uh, subliminal I, I guess are very quiet subtle they can be hidden much better and they're they're more volunt uh, voluntary whereas with ticks a lot of the times the, re the compulsions are a action an involuntary action that can't really be stopped or, or hidden or pulled back or hold within the mind it comes out it, so that's the difference uh, they, and they talk about the triggers with it with just right and it's really all the senses I mean any of the senses um, you know they they can be touch they can be seeing something that isn't just right it's not a lot a picture on the wall that's not adjusted right that's tilted or they think it's tilted they get a sense that it's tilted um, a touch uh, like in my daughter's case the touch was the floor of her room initially felt like it had gravel on it or dirt on it you know and so it was very much about touch you know, I had a client that it was about pictures. A lot of times he'd stand in front of a picture and have to spend hours until it got just right, which was so hard to, to do. So it can be any of those uh, situations. One that I hadn't thought about that they bring up here um, is a, pers a person's personal expression and I'll read their, their example here because I think it's pretty good. A person might need to express himself or herself precisely in writing or spoken word. Or I would even think in how you act out something or you know, do something. They have to do it in a certain way. And so, because they, they also talk in here about how it affects life. And oh my God, that, you know how it affects life there's so many ways but I could understand they talk about they break it down into three categories where it affects like daily life ac academic or work life and then social life and the the personal expression and getting it just right when it comes to, especially in academics and I I work with somebody that um, would be had a hard time turning papers in and getting you know, ended up not turning a lot in and flunking things because it just never was just right, written, spelled, grammar, whatever it could be. So it really affected their academic life. But, you know, I always looked at it in all OCD that it, it really shuts your life down. You know, recently had a client uh, that came in and was living with her sister who had taken her in, but she was, you know, her sister was trying to get her to stop this stuff, so she she would get upset with her and, you know, try to help her, in, but was doing it in the wrong style. She was coming out as a, as the uh, uh, sergeant in charge or something, I guess you'd say. And so her sister was avoiding, she was getting late for school, she was a teacher she was getting late for school teaching because she would she felt like she had to wait till her sister left the house so she could do her things she needed to do and those things were growing and building uh, in time and in energy and it was exhausting her and it was making her late all kinds of things. so it builds on itself so it, it really eventually if not treated just about any of the OCDs will take over your life. Fold. I always talk about it folding our life in because that's what it did for us. You know, we, we didn't go anywhere, do anything outside of what we absolutely had to do. And it even disrupted that. So it's very disruptive in what it does. Um, so, you know, because it, it'll start out as one thing and that's the... And I think I talked about this before in a podcast that OCD adapts well. It if you clear up one thing, it's going to bring about another thing. Um, it's 
you know, le- you know, I just I, I wanted to leave us leave us alone because it just keeps reappearing and finding its way back into it. So it may start out as one thing, but it leads to so much more. You know, and 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 they talk about in the symptoms for especially for just right. It's about perfectionism. It is very much about perfectionism, which of course to me is is almost har- impossible to reach. And I, I start looking at it perfectionism in two different ways. One, I, I've always you know been on one side of that camp of saying there's no such thing as perfection. It's impossible to reach. Um, you know that it's re- it's really about your own norms and standards of your s- inside yourself, not what's outside of yourself, about other people's norms. It's about what's what's perfect for you, what's perfect inside, and it's very hard to reach because it just. But there's also that other side of it, which I you know just in the last year or so started really thinking about, is that it is about. Um, we're all perfect, just as we are. You know, that kind of godliness, or I guess we might call it. So you can look at perfectionism as impossible to reach. Or you can look at it on the other end of the scale, I guess, as we're perfect just the way we are, in perf- in, with faults and all, you know. So, yeah, I I think perfectionism plays a huge role. And perfectionism is an anxiety driver. It it will take things into the ethers of anxiety. Uh, So, you know, they also, there's a lot of... a lot of the just right symptoms are the same symptoms of other OCDs, you know, the checking, the counting, etc. But they talk about here uh, a sense in the mind of restlessness that they can never get it to stop, you know, the broken record. Now that's common, somewhat common, really common symptoms of all, um, all OCD, but this is a, a huge driver for the just right. Um, you know, and, and then it makes it uh, difficult to make decisions. And of course, if you can't make decisions, it, you become inflexible and you can't delegate. So if you have OCD and you're in a manager's position, oh my God, how how stressful and anxiety-driven that can be because you can't make the decisions, you can't delegate because they're not going to do it right, you know. And so you get very inflexible that things have to be done a certain way and that that can't work in when you're working with other people who do things differently than you um, and still get them done and done right. You know, I, I use that term loosely, uh, but they don't do it the way you think right should be or you think it should be. So that makes a, a very highly stressful place to be. So I see just right um, as as a type of OCD. It can be a type, but I also see it very playing into each one of the other types of OCD because they're all trying to resolve and make things right in a way and, and make sure that they're, you know, that, you know, they avoid things so that, you know, harm doesn't come to somebody or bad luck or whatever it might be. So I think it is a separate type, but I think it also needs to be, these same things need to be looked at within the realm of all OCD. And then, of course, they talk about treatments. And, of course, my big and best treatment of all is, of course, ERP therapy, exposure response prevention. And there's a, if you if you listen to my podcast, you may have heard it already. If not, you can go back to, I believe it's number 14, if I remember right, and look that up and listen to about ERP because it is the best way to get past OCD. Um, And of course, uh, the way I do it is to tie that my EFT practice, my tapping process, in with the ERP to speed up that process and make it more effective. So there are treatment uh, efforts out there, 
and I know I, I can get you there too. So I do want to throw out a simple little plug about myself that I can help you through that, coach you through that those ERP therapies and make them faster with the EFT. So I hope this has helped. I hope this has been uh, rewarding to you. And I wish you the best of the day for yourself and take care. That concludes this podcast. Please leave me a comment or question below. That gives me good direction where to go on future podcasts. I would love to hear your invisible wheelchair stories if you're willing to share it. If you would, go to invisiblewheelchair.com and click on Tell Your Story. I want to remind you that OCD, Obsessive Compulsive Disorder, is treatable. And I can help you get past OCD. So, if you have heard this podcast and others, and you feel like you need further assistance and would like to spend some time with me working through any issues you have, then feel free to book a session at FocusedHealthyFamily.com or FamilyOCD.com or you can call me at 704-562-1630. I also offer $85 off initial discovery session if you mention that you heard it on this podcast. Finally, don't forget that there is a tapping recording that coincides with this podcast you may want to take advantage of. I hope you have enjoyed this podcast and will join me for the next one. Remember to keep tapping, talking, and transcending your life to new heights. Thank you, and have a great day.